Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677, and a person from our team will respond, and we will help you move forward together. Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677, and a person from our team will respond, and we will help you move forward together.
Hey everyone, my name is Zach. And my name is Sean, and we are so glad you logged in to join us this weekend. We're so excited about it. We know there's a lot of things you could be doing on your weekend, and the fact that you chose to spend an hour of your time with us, it means the world to us. If you're new, we'd love to share real quick what's gonna happen today so you know what to expect. All in all, we're gonna be here for just over an hour. We're gonna start by singing together. We love to worship loudly at Vail, so go ahead, turn your speakers up and follow along with the words in the bottom corner. After that, we're going to hear a great encouraging message. We will provide you with next step opportunities in your faith journey, so please stick around afterwards. Throughout the service, we will have the chat feed open for you to share your thoughts and dive into online community with others who are literally watching around the world. That's not a joke. We are so excited for all God is doing here at Vail. And we believe that watching Vail Online, it's a great first step. So as you check us out today, I would love to invite you and encourage you to come and join us in person at one of our upcoming weekend experiences. Listen, our service times are shown below. You, your family, and your friends will have plenty of space with full programming from birth to adults. Vail is consistently growing and expanding to bring more people into the church. We believe in community and would love for you to be a part of what God is doing here at Vail. We hope to see you in person real soon. Yeah, like maybe next weekend. Like right, right now. Or now. No, well, next they weekend. They can't next, next weekend. We'll see you next weekend. Well, anyways, this service is about to begin, so open up the Vail Church app wherever you are, in your car, laying in bed, on the couch, making breakfast. I don't know. Maybe you're actually watching worldwide doing one of those traveling things. Guys, just come visit. That's all. Anyways, hit the full screen button. And let's jump into the service. We love you.
singing a song about going through storms. And what I know is that there's probably some people in this room, maybe you got some tough news this past week, maybe you got some awful news this morning, or maybe you've been going through a season, you're wondering, can I, can I get through this season? I need you to know, man, God has given you the perseverance to get through it. We just got to sing before this song about a victorious God that is with us, that he's not left you or forsaken you, that he's in the midst of the storm with you today. So I wanna encourage you as we go in this time of prayer, is that you take these things that cause you worry. There's a scripture in Philippians that says, those things that cause you worry, that cause you anxiety, to lift them up in prayer. Why? Because God then delivers a peace beyond understanding to you in the midst of that situation. Doesn't mean it's gonna be solved. Doesn't mean that you're gonna find clarity, but it means in those moments, all you need is peace. So in this moment, would you just, would, would you pray with me together? And you have those moments that you're going through, would you just lift those up in prayer to God? May God, we lift these things up to you because you are victorious, that you are good that you are a God who cares. The things that we're dealing with, the things that we worry about, you care about, and Lord, I pray that you would deliver some peace today. Whether it's bad news, whether it's the season that you've been going through, that you deliver a peace beyond any understanding, that we get to walk in faith, that we believe, Lord, that you are with us, that you have given the strength and the perseverance to get through it. God, you are so good, you are so faithful. And I thank this and I pray these things all in your name. We all said? Amen, amen. Well, grab a seat. It is, man, a great day to be here. It's a beautiful time to be in here while it's raining outside. Uh, my name is Mike. I can serve on staff as one of the pastors here. And if you're new to Vail, I'd like to say thanks so much for coming today. Maybe you had somebody come invite you. Uh, maybe you found us online, but we are so glad you're here and we would love to be able to connect with you. So if you're new, would you do me a favor? Would you take out your phones really quick Text the number on the screen, text next to that number, which is 309-777-0677. If you don't have a phone with you, don't worry, we've got you covered. If you look in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a red card that says, My Next Step. Grab that card, fill that out, check the I'm New Here box, and drop it off at the info center as you leave today. And here's the cool thing. For every card and text that we get in, uh, we, one, make a one-time donation on your behalf to a local ministry partner outside the walls of Vail. So just by being here today, whether you're in the room with us or you're with us online, you've actually made a difference in our local community. The second thing is we give you a free gift just to say thanks so much. I know it can be a little daunting um, coming into a new environment. We are so glad you're here. So we want to give you a free gift just to say thanks so much for coming and checking us out. And if you're in the room with us today, you got some little ones with you. I know as they could become restless at some point in today's service, we we'll want to let you know that outside in the lobby, we have this whole service broadcasted live. We have a space for you and your family to enjoy today's experience uninterrupted with some soft seating and some toys for you and the kiddos. And with, when it comes down to Vail, a lot of great things happen on Saturday and Sunday, but it's also some incredible things that happen throughout the week. And I see a lot of ladies in the room, and I think you work really hard, ladies. And you need a night away. You need a night out together. We've got one coming up for you on May 3rd. We have Sisterhood coming up. So make sure you get signed up for that. It's an incredible night of worship, a message, and an amazing after party. So husbands, if you're next to your wife, nudge your wife, say, hey, you need to go to this. If there are dads in the room, you got, you're on dad duty. You can't, you know, hire a babysitter. You got to take care of the kids that night. And guys, we haven't forgotten about you this Tuesday. We have an event for you at Gill Street. We're going to be throwing some axes from 6 to 8 p.m. So if you're a husband, you just nudge your wife saying, hey, you should go to sisterhood. Nudge your back like, hey, I should go to this. Because uh, it's going to be an incredible night of guys getting together. And one thing I know to be true is that these nights are better when you're there. And lastly, on May 4th and 5th, we're gonna have a thing called Child Dedication Weekend. So if you have, a, man, a newborn that you just had, we wanna celebrate you as a parent. And why we do that in our service, why we come and bring parents up and we see these beautiful babies, we're really there to celebrate you because God knew one thing is that the greatest way for your child to know Jesus, to know God, was through your parents. And how exciting is that, is that these kids are gonna grow up in a household to know of a creator that loves them and has a purpose for them. And all of these three things I just announced, you can find them on our app and also on our website. Make sure you go and register today and get signed up for any of those that apply to you. 
And as we get ready for today's message, we like to do one thing. Veil can be very big. We like to take a moment to make it a little bit smaller to get to know some people around us. So as you get ready for summer plans and vacations, we thought we'd ask a would you rather question. So look to your neighbor and ask this question is this, would you rather visit every country in the world or visit space once? Random question, go for it. o'clock, those who like to sleep in. Come on, how you feeling today? You doing good? Glad you're here. Um, got really, really good news for you. I don't know if you know this, but the tomb is still empty. Jesus is alive and he's still king because every day is Easter, Easter Sunday. So we had such a powerful Easter uh, weekend last weekend. We had five services and because of amazing volunteers, people praying and making room, uh, we served over 3,800 people. But the best thing is 24 people made a decision to follow Jesus last week at all. So we're so grateful for what God is doing. And uh, maybe you made that decision. Maybe you said, I decided to follow Jesus recently. Scripture is very clear that our next step is to go public with our faith through baptism. It's just a picture of how Jesus went to the grave and he came out. Uh, it's a picture of us putting our old self in the grave and coming out a new person. If you have not done that yet, I promise you, you will never regret being obedient to Christ. And so in two weeks, we are having Baptism Sunday and we would love to celebrate you and your family, however that looks like. So feel free to do that. Also, for those who are here, my name is Sean Jensen, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Vail. Forgot to tell you that. Like, who's this guy with this bright shirt on? I don't want to listen to him. So, uh, no, we're glad that you're here, but uh, we're going to jump in today. And before we do, we have amazing people at our church called the Vail Leadership Team. And they are, I'm, I get to serve on that team, but they want to do this whole thing right. They hold us accountable. Uh, they're learning to love me. I'm the new guy, so I've been here for six months. And uh, they're learning to love me, but they love this church. And we just want to do this right, church. Like, we really do. And so if you see this badge, on someone out in the lobby at any time, feel free to approach them. You can give any feedback during the transition, what God is doing. They would love to hear from you. We just want to make sure that you are heard and that you can, uh, that we can just hear, or hear what God is doing in our church. And also, if you see them, no less than a 20-second hug either. So you have to grab them and never let go, all right? You're welcome, BLT. Appreciate you so much. No. So, cool. Well, we're going to jump into a new series that we're calling, I Love Jesus, But Not the Church. And uh, as we talk about this today, let me just give you an idea of where we're going. Uh, but for the next three weeks, I really believe that we're going to see some healing in our church. We're already seeing it this weekend. I think God's going to work through it, and I think it's going to prepare us for what he wants to do in our church. Now, I'm hoping to get through this. It might be quick today so you can get lunch because my voice is running out. So if you could be praying for me, that would be great. I didn't realize Easter would take this much out of me, y'all, but... It's my first time here. It's great. So we're going to be in Genesis. So if you have your Bible or the Veil app, we're going to be in the first book of the Bible. Uh, the Bible is broken in two parts, Old Testament, New Testament, if you're new to our faith. Uh, it's Old Covenant, New Covenant. The Old Covenant between God and the Israel, uh, nation of Israel. And Jesus would come from this nation, the New Testament. He would come and die on the cross. He would rise again for the redemption of mankind. And so we're going to be in the Old Testament. Before the nation of Israel started, this is where it started. So in this moment, this guy named Abram who will be called Abraham because God can change names, and Sarai, who will be Sarah. In this moment, he is living for 75 years in his own hometown, and God shows up and says, I want you to leave everything and go to a place I will show you. I don't know about you, but I like to know where I'm going. He doesn't tell him that part. He just says, be obedient. And if you do, I will bless you and give you as many descendants as stars in the sky. The only issue was is Sarai and Abram could not have kids. And so this was an impossible thing. But so be it, they stepped out in faith. And after 10 years of obedience and stepping out in faith, they still have nothing to show for it. No kid, no promise. And they're getting, their faith's getting a little weary. And so in this moment, they do what I think a lot of us can do sometimes. We're waiting on God. 
they take things into their own hands, all right? And so we're going to look at this moment and see what happens in Genesis 16. Some weird stuff happens here, but I'll explain it, especially if you're new to our faith, all right? Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, by the way, if you're expecting a daughter, it's a great name, no one has that name, I feel like, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Okay, let's stop here for a second. This is weird. If you've been in church your entire life, like, yep, I've heard this before. This is weird. So if you're here and you're new to our faith, let me just kind of explain what's going on. When you study scripture, if you're new to it, let me give you an idea. Just in case you heard something weird on TikTok or you've heard these theologians who claim to be theologians. When you study scripture, you have to understand that there's prescriptive texts and descriptive texts. So when you look at scripture, there's going to be moments that describe what is happening. And there's going to be moments that prescribe something that's going to make our life better like Jesus would do. So people actually reject our faith because they think God is pro-polygamy and pro-slavery. That's not what's happening here. This is descriptive. It's describing a moment. And we're going to find out that this does not work well in their favor. So this is just describing it. Every time people go against what God had initially designed, it ends up in heartache. Okay? So descriptive, prescriptive. He's describing this. And we're going to unpack a little bit more what's going on. Then Sarah said to Abram. After this whole encounter, then Sarah said, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, and so she fled from her. She ran away from what she knew. She ran out of the situation. Now, I got a pretty big task today to talk about a pretty big topic and so I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit for help because I need his help today. So, Lord, uh, I thank you for bringing us together. Lord, I know that my words can only go so far, but whatever healing you want to do, whatever correction you want to do, whatever encouragement you want to do, Lord, just go beyond my words and amplify them. We thank you that we get to gather under one name, your name, Jesus. We pray these things in that name. Amen. Amen. So I have been pinching myself every day that I get to live out, I believe, what God has called me to do. Not that everyone needs to be a pastor, but it's just amazing that I have the privilege of serving people in this context. I can't even fathom what all God is doing in my life, but that does not mean that I've gotten it all right. Um, I don't want to air out my dirty laundry list with you, but as a pastor, sometimes in the heart to protect the sheep, as people would say, or that, I can get a little passionate, and sometimes when people I feel they're in danger, I can react in ways that aren't helpful. And I remember when I planted the church a couple years in, uh, what ended up having a disagreement ended up me chewing out a lady on the phone um, because of some situations that arose. I was impatient. I wasn't kind. There were some wounds that were there. I was vulnerable. I was tired. I was exhausted. And it resulted in me trying to put someone in place because I thought I was right. After this whole thing happened, her husband called me and had an issue, and he confronted me gently and saying, you should have not done that. That was not right of you. You should have involved both of us. And he was right. But it was in that moment where I realized that he was right, but I also wanted to be like, you're right, but only if she had, you know what I'm saying? Like, you want to justify yourself? And I realized in that moment that I actually brought some hurt to some people in our church who helped with the church. And even though God can restore and reconcile, that relationship was never really to the full effect it was at that time. I say that because I want to question, I have a question for you. Have you ever been church hurt? Have you ever experienced hurt from the church? I know when we talk about I love Jesus, but not the church, we have people leaving the church in groves because they claim that there's been some hurt and some things that have happened. And so we have a lot of people fleeing the church because of hurt that has transpired. Now, it wouldn't be helpful for me to sit up here as a pastor and be like, well, I've been hurt too. My goal was to hope we understand that me as a pastor have inflicted pain in people's life as well. And so a lot of times we look at Hagar in this moment, but sometimes we need to understand that we can be Sarai as well. And so we look at this moment when it comes to it, and maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been hurt by the church. And maybe it was a church member. Maybe it was a pastor or a ministry director or leader. Maybe it was someone in your group when you stepped out or someone you were serving with. Maybe it was a member of another church. Or you just, before you came to Christ, you had an encounter with a church person, right? And you wondered if they just ate like 14 lemons before they met you because they always seemed so upset. just so sour, you know. And, uh, and they're just so upset. And, and maybe, just maybe, you've experienced this pain. 
and it's hurt deep down, and you're wondering where you are, I can't help but think of Hagar. Hagar, in this moment, was hurt what I would call by quote-unquote church people. Now, Jesus has not yet come. He has not died and rose again and built his church. But Abram and Sarai were considered the ancestors of our faith. These were God's people that he was going to use in a great way. And these were people who Hagar should have trusted, should have been able to be encouraged by, should have felt love, and should have felt protected by. But in this moment, they used their authority and they abuse Hagar to get their own gain. And it turns into a big mess. And now Hagar is fleeing from the place because she is hurt by the church, by God's people. And maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're watching online and we believe that something powerful happens when we gather as a church, but it's safer on your couch right now because you don't want to put yourself in the place that got you hurt in the first place. Or maybe you're watching on a different platform, a viral platform that's less threatening because you can just get it in bite size, but you just don't want to put yourself back out there because the pain's too inevitable. Or maybe you're here and you're fleeing in your heart. Man, you're, you've already fled from this place in your heart and your body's about to follow suit. Or maybe just maybe you fled here from a different place that you ended up at that place because you fled from another place because it feels like you're just constantly seeing church hurt. Now, we're gonna do this for three weeks, but my goal today, if we talk about healing and all this, I know the church is an imperfect place, we'll get to that, but my goal today, which I think sometimes the church may not do the best at, is when people are church hurt, we take 10% of the time saying where the hurt was inflicted, and we spend 90% of the time telling them how they should get healed. That's not gonna be my goal today. My goal is gonna talk about how us as a church can be less hurtful. And how we can look at this encounter and see if we can be challenged to be better at this. My goal, though, is not to take care of church or inevitably. That's impossible. It will never happen. But hopefully we can look inside and we can say, how can we be better at this? And how can we be a place of healing? And so what we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit, look at it from a different idea. So this was a crime that was committed against Hagar. And so I just kind of wrapped my mind with the sermon planning team on what we could do. And so we decided we're going to kind of use like a criminology approach. So if you're like an SVU fan, don't, don't. You know what I'm saying? Like... It's like season 152, like how all, like was this around in the, anyway, so I'm not going to go, I got to finish, my voice is running out. But we're going to look at this from like a crime standpoint, a crime committed against Hagar and how there's different levels of church hurt, different level of crime, and how we can process that and as we can heal, move in together. So the first thing we got to talk about is church hurt in the first degree, all right? So any crime in the first degree is a premeditated or intentional crime. That's what that looks like. So when it comes to church hurt, it was something that was thought about or intentional when the hurt happened. This is the most serious and the most damaging in church hurt today. And this is exactly what happened in, in Genesis. It said that Sarah was upset because she thinks the Lord has kept her from having children. And so she says, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So she, in this moment, is being intentional and premeditating what she feels like is going to be best. And what she feels like is best is, you know what, I can't, ha I can't have a child. I'm waiting on God to work. And sometimes when we're waiting on the promises of God, we can put, take things in our own hands. And so in a moment where she wants something, she abuses someone else to get there. And we have to be careful in the church that we know God's got promises for Vail. We know God's got promises for each of us in this room. But we have to be careful that we don't focus on self as much as others. But in this moment, they abuse their authority for their own gain. And now Hagar is hurting because of it. And there's a lot of people in our culture are hurting because they were used for someone else's gain. And then we've been used for our own gain. Man, if you serve in Vail kids, you should know what church hurt is. <laughs> They're vicious. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My, my three-year-old, if you serve with her, I'm sorry she calls you poopy butt cheeks. I don't know where she learned it. I know it's crass. Please don't hold it against me. And we're like, where did you learn this? My daughter will say, Daddy, I want to spend time with you. And I'm like, cool, where are we going? To the, to the store to buy a toy. Okay, so you don't want to spend time with me. You want a toy, right? Premeditated church hurt. Church hurt can come when we think about how something can benefit us without understanding how it could burden others. I get a toy, you pay for it. I get the promise, you get the pain. I get what God wants in me, I'll trample over you to get it. And we have to be careful as our church grows and as we do these things that we remind ourselves 
that we can find ourselves in these places. And so what stemmed from this? What happened was Sarai was envious. She had something that she couldn't get and she was hurting. And so she went after her own way. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, actually warns about this behavior. And I'm just going to tell you, James is a straight shooter. So before you get mad at me, get mad at James, all right? Because this is intense. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. It goes on to say, such wisdom does not come down from heaven. This is intense. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. James, did you want to say anything else there? Are you good? All right. So for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. He's like, if these are the motives, malpractice is going to be the product. Malpractice, just like we hear in today's age, when someone has malpractice, it's something they practice that they weren't supposed to, and a lot of pain has come from it. There's a lot of malpractice that's happened in the church. We hear about church scandals. We've heard about people abusing their authority. We've heard about verbal abuse and dictatorships. We've seen these things. But we also, in a serious manner, we've heard of sexual abuse as well. These premeditated, intentional things that they're envious for something and in their own way, they abuse people to get it. And when that happens, you'll find every evil practice. You see, when we envy, what this means is when we have something in our life that we think we deserve, that God hasn't given us yet, we can become envious. Sarai was going to have a child, it's just not when she wanted it and she got envious. Be careful living in a world full of everyone looking at everyone else's life, that you don't grow envious. Because the moment your business does, the moment the church does, and the moment our family does, then we'll step into selfish ambition. And what selfish ambition is, is this word factitious. It means we will do natural means. We'll use human means when only God wants to provide it in supernatural ways. And what tends to happen is you find a wake of dead bodies behind you. And so, Sarai has now hurt Hagar. And so we have to be careful that we don't do this. In a day and age where people go viral off other people's pain, if you notice this, people are not trying to bring awareness to people's pain. They just want influence. And what they do is they get followers on platforms while talking about other people's pain because if I can get more likes, let me tell you this very good. If God wants to promote you or if God wants to bring the promise to you, he's not going to hurt other people to get you there. He's big enough to take care of it. Now, we can talk about if you felt hurt in a different week, but this is what it looks like if we're not careful, if we operate in our own selfish ambition. And we've all done it. And we've all been there. And thank God for his grace. But we have to be aware of it. Which leads me to the church hurt in the second degree. See, the second degree is not premeditated. It's not intentional, but the pain was intended. It may come from a crime of passion or something that's happened. So me and our, our production director, Bryce, we decided to word this thing different. We looked up second degree murder. We just thought murder was a pretty intense word to use for church or you've been murdered. So we're like, let's change that up a little bit. And so we looked up second degree murder. And what we did is we changed up the word murder for church hurt. And this is what the crime looks like in this moment. It says he or she is acting under a sudden intense passion. Where are my passionate people at? Anybody got some passionate people? Oh, I'm the only one. All right, cool. You know how do I know I'm passionate? It's when you raise your voice and instead of saying, I'm yelling, you go, I'm just passionate. <laughs> okay, gotcha. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna call you out. This series is already too intense. All right, resulting from serious provocation by the individual causing church hurt or another whom the offender endeavors to hurt, but he or she negligently or accidentally causes the church hurt of the individual. So this now kind of stems more into a place of negligence or accidental, but how many people know this mantra? Hurt people, hurt people. We've heard that in our culture, right? That hurt people actually hurt people. What if I convince you today that this is exactly what Sarah was stemming from? First, it was premeditated and intentional, but the hurt kept coming. In this moment, after Hagar's conceived, we see this moment happen before she fled. So Abram slept with Hagar, she conceived, and when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise Sarai. Sarai said to Abraham, 
you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I'm leaving this alone because I don't want to talk about women because men are just as big of a mess, okay? So I put my slave in your arms. They both need to learn from here. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Let's look at this for a second. Hurt people hurt people. Now, what if I convince you that Sarah was hurt? Now, granted, she is in the mess because it was a self-inflicted wound, right? Like, she caused this mess. And if we could just be honest for a moment before we continue on, a lot of our hurts come because of our decisions. Have you noticed that when we bring hurt to our life, we just say, everything happens for a reason. (laughs) But when someone else inflicts us with pain, we're like, they did it. Right? It's like everything happens for a reason, and sometimes that reason is we are dumb. Like that's the reason. But God's grace is still can work in our, whether we got us into this mess or didn't, God's grace can still work through our mess. That's not what I'm saying, but she's in pain. And so in this moment, Hagar shows up. She's treating Sarai differently. Now, the word slave is a, a hard word to use in this context. The Hebrew word actually means maid. So Hagar is actually Sarai's maid, is with her throughout the day, helps her cook, helps her take care of the house. They're constantly around each other, which shows me that most hurt comes from people who are closest to us. That's why it's so traumatic when it happens in the church, the place we least expect it from. And so it hurts. It's traumatic. In this moment, Sarai lashes out at Hagar, who she's the one that hurt, and then she flees. But Sarai felt despised by Hagar, but she was already feeling despised by God. Remember how it started? The Lord has not given me a child. He will not allow it. She was actually bitter at God. She was hurt. And the moment that Hagar despised her, she felt something she's already felt, rejection. And it just amplified. So I have a lot of people in our culture today who have unresolved trauma that can end up hurting people. Let me tell you about my dog. My dog is a, you're like, why? <laughs> it was weird. My dog is a great dog. She, is, she was incredible. And we would like play Frisbee and everything. Never had an issue with her. And I remember one day I came home and she jumped up on me and I was petting her and rubbing her, doing the whole thing. And when I went to rub her ears, next thing I know, she yelped very loud, and then she bit my hand. And I was shocked. Like, this is, un- this is unnatural behavior. What just happened? I remember being like, Liz, like, the dog just bit me. And then as I began to look at her ears, I realized that as I was rubbing her, she actually had a bug bite that kind of got infected, and there was this wound behind her ear. And what happened is when I hit the wound, she snapped. You know why we bite people? Because we're bitter. And bitterness bites. The author of Hebrews tells us this. He says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Sarah was already bitter. And now she's biting Hagar. Hagar. He says this, let's make every effort to live in peace and to be what? Holy. Scripture says if you're in Christ that the Holy Spirit resides in us and he transforms us to look like God. We find in Scripture that we are called to be holy for God is holy. That's what it says. And it says, holiness, without it, no one will see the Lord. Can we all agree that if you're in Christ, we want people to see God. We want people to know who he is, to see who he is. And he says, without holiness, they can't see it. Because if we never look changed, they're never going to experience God. Let me tell you about a God who's done everything in my life. Man, you look like the same person 15 years ago. No, no, holiness will begin to get people's attention. What's the word holiness? Holiness is wholeness. It's actually purified. It's healing. And so what he's saying in this moment is he goes, don't let a bitter root grow up to cause trouble and defile many. So we have holiness, but we have this thing that bitter, when we are bitter, when something happens to us, it takes root and it says it will grow and it will defile many. Did you know bitterness bitterness kills churches? Bitterness destroys families. Bitterness destroys workplaces. Why? Because it doesn't just affect you. It grows and affects many. And so she's bitter and she attacks. And so maybe, just maybe, the reason why we've hurt someone is because we have unmet wounds. 
Holiness is healing from the trauma of the world. How do we get better? How as we as a church make sure we don't lash out more? We let the Holy Spirit make us holy. I believe one of the best ways we can hurt people less is if we begin to take care of our own wounds. Let God work in us. Bring those things to God. We all have trauma. We all have baggage. We all have things that we've brought into this room that we, God wants to heal in our life. That's why we come to the church. We'll talk about that in the weeks to follow. But my goal is if we want to hurt people less, then we need to heal ourselves. Because if hurt people hurt people, then the opposite must be true. Heal people heal people. And so if we allow God to heal us, then we can heal others. And so my hope is when it comes to first degree, man, let's make sure that we work on the envy and let's make sure that we work on doing what the motive is, is pure and in Christ. And in this one, let's just make sure that as we grow in our faith in God, that we are actually handling, man, this is good for marriage. This is good for business leaders. When we don't understand that we have wounds, what we do is we end up hurting people next to us because they pressed on things we didn't know that we suffered with. And so when we feel small, we realize they weren't intending to do that, but because of the tra trauma we face as kids, it amplifies it and we lash out. So let's heal. Why? Because heal people, heal people. Which leads me to my last thing. <laughs> I'm almost there. My voice is going to make it. Church hurt in the third degree. Now, the third degree is when people honestly think they're doing what's best. Now, this one's tough. Because you kind of want to justify what's going on. But a lot of times, church hurt comes from people who are just trying to figure this thing out. Sometimes it's incompetence. Sometimes they're making decisions. Man, I know in my life, when I looked at the church that I planted, there are specific messages we took off YouTube. I was like, don't ever let anyone hear that again. Because by God's grace, he has taught me what scripture looks like. And so sometimes in our growth with Christ, the third degree, which is still serious, it comes from a more incompetent area. So in Genesis 16, 6, Abram says, your slave is in your hands. Abram said, do with her whatever you think is best. So Abram says, I know you're having trouble, Sarai, and you're asking me what to do, and here's my answer. Do whatever you think is best. And so what does she do? Sarai mistreats her. And sometimes we don't realize it, but our mistreatment comes from what we think is best. I'm gonna go put them in their place. Is that best? I'm gonna open my mouth. Maybe you should shut it. <laughs> I mean, we see this with politicians. We see this with business owners and business leaders. A lot of times in their mind, they're doing what they think is best. And in doing so, there's a lot more hurt. There's a lot more pain. Man, if you wanna see people who think they're trying their best, I mean this, just listen to Christians at a funeral. Well-intended people who really do care will say things like, well, maybe God just wanted them sooner. That hurts. God just wanted another angel. Really, dude? See, it's like this incompetence. It's this thing that can happen and bring pain. So Sarai goes, okay, I'm going to mistreat her. I'm going to show her who's boss. I'm going to lash back. I'm going to fight back because that's what we want to do. But I want to push back on Abram a little bit. <clears throat> I want to push back on his advice and give you a different advice as we close today. Maybe instead of doing what we think is best, we should strive in doing whatever God says is best. Maybe that's a good thing. Now, people might say, but there's been a lot of people who have done crazy things because they said God told them to. Listen, do not look at people who've done crazy things because they misconstrued and, and screwed up the scriptures to not say that scripture is full of things that we can do to help this hurting world. So we might want to open our mouth and Jesus says, no, keep it shut. We might want to lash out and Jesus says, turn the other cheek. We might want to give them a taste of our own, their medicine, but Jesus says, forgive them and pray for them. Why? Because church hurt will come with whatever we think is best. But if we say, man, whatever God thinks is best, whatever God thinks. So I think what would have been different if Sarah said, what does God think is best? Well, I don't think she would have mistreated Hagar. I think she would have said, you know what? The reason why Hagar is mistreating me is because I broke her trust. I used her. She's showing contempt to me because I hurt her. I need to take ownership of this. I need to say I'm sorry. 
I need to work on restoration. See, that's what God would have asked us to do, right? And so as we land this plane today, it's going to feel a little weird because my goal for us today is this. Maybe, just maybe, you might be Hagar. We'll get that in a second. But maybe you've been like me, like my first story, and you've been Sarai. I want to challenge our church so that we can experience holiness and experience God's power. If we have hurt anybody, I want to challenge you to reconcile it. I want to challenge you to say you're sorry. I want to challenge you to reach out and say, hey, forgive me for this. I want to challenge you to restore what, what God has broken. That doesn't mean you have to be best friends. It just means let's take ownership. Now, if you're here and you feel like Hagar, I can't apologize that I was the one who hurt you, but I can't say I'm sorry that you're going through pain. And if you are fleeing from your life right now and church is the last place you want to be, if you're online or maybe in here, and you're like, it just took courage for me to get here. I want to say these words to you as well. God sees you and he's not done with you. Because Hagar runs for her life, but in verse 7 it says this, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. I, I want to encourage you that even in her hate, hurt and pain, the Lord found her. The Lord saw her. The Lord sees you and he's not done with you either. And so if you're here and you feel broken and you feel hurt, I want to remind you, God's not done with you. But this is going to feel weird. We're not going to resolve this this week. Next week, we're going to find out what God tells Hagar and how she can experience the blessing that he has for her still and how she can heal from this church hurt. But we're going to do that next week. And today, we're just going to sit in this. And we're going to end in prayer. And we're going to ask God to heal any hurt that's in this place because he's the healer. And we're also going to ask that he would begin to work in our heart and that we would see him begin to heal not just us, but he would give us the courage to go and heal others. And so what we're going to do, we're going to pray. And while I pray, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus was hurt by the church. The Pharisees threw him on a cross. And he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he was on that cross for your sin and my sin so he could reconcile our relationship with God. The whole gospel was restoration. If you need a relationship with Jesus, you can put your faith in him today. That's rain. Don't worry about it. Just a loud roof. <laughs> so let's pray and ask God to heal us while opening up the door for that. So Lord, we just pray right now. Thank you for allowing my voice to hold up, Lord. I thank you. I pray right now, Father God, for those who are here, who may have hurt people like I have. I know you've forgiven us and your grace is big, but Lord, your ultimate heart is restoration. That's why you sent Jesus on the cross. And so Lord, I pray right now that you would just pop people in our heart, names, people, that we can just restore, that we can reach out to, that we can humble ourselves and apologize, that we can do what you think is best. And I pray for anyone in here who is hurt, that you'd begin to see them heal. I pray they would open their heart to you. I pray they would invite you in. That even though Hagar felt like she was out by herself, you saw her. So if you're here today and you feel like no one sees you, God sees you. Lord, could you do a deep work right now in our hearts? Heal us. I pray, Lord, that we would dispense the offense, that we would forgive those who've hurt us, that we don't want to be tied down so we can experience your freedom. Lord, we love you for that. If you're here and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, just like we've seen people do this weekend, here's a prayer you can pray of faith. It's a prayer that confesses Jesus is Lord of your life. Just pray this prayer with me and focus your attention on God and your relationship with God. You just got to say this. You say, God, thank you for sending your son Jesus. I'm the sinner. He is the Savior. Thank you, Jesus for paying my debt on the cross. Thank you for doing what I couldn't do. And thank you for rising from the grave so I could have new life. I want a new life in Christ today. I need your spirit to make me holy. I need a new life and I want to follow you and I want to trust you from this day forward. I want my relationship with you restored. I believe in you, Jesus. And I pray this in your name. Amen and amen. If you pray that prayer, you made the best decision of your life. Listen, just like that, God has restored that relationship. He does not look at your past. He sees Jesus in you. And we want to celebrate that today. So I'm going to ask you to do something bold. If you pray that prayer, 
for the first time. We're not going to embarrass you. At the count of three, we're going to ask you to throw your hand up as high as possible. Here's why. We have a church ready to clap and celebrate you. That's it. And then when you raise your hand, one of our ushers is going to bring a box your way that's going to be a resource guide to help you take next steps in your journey. And it's going to help you understand the journey and the steps you just made. So if that's you today at the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand so we can celebrate you. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he died us again. Three, if you said that was me, I made a decision to follow Jesus, I want you to throw your hand up high so one of our hosts can see you and so that we can celebrate you. If you're online, there is a link that you can click as well. Well, praise God, we've seen three people make that decision all weekend. Can we celebrate our family today? So cool, we have to celebrate people making decisions and maybe a next step for you today is one of baptism. Every single month we get to see people come in and make public professions of faith. We get to share their testimonies. And some of you in this room have maybe been following Jesus for a little while now and you've, you've yet to get baptized. Maybe you've waited, you felt like you waited too long. I need you to know like you haven't waited. Like it, this is like your next step. People in this room, people online may need to hear how God has, man, radically transformed your life. What he's brought you from, where he's brought you to, and like the new faith that you have in him. Like people need to hear that. So if you want to take that next step of baptism, simply just text NEXT to 309-777-0677. Or you can fill out the My Next Step card. Like right now is, is the right time. Let's celebrate that together. And I want to take a pause real quick as we can kind of continue our service. We talk about giving. Um, if you've been in church long enough, you've probably heard this passage of Scripture. Uh, if you look in their seat backs in front of you, you'll see a giving envelope. They'll have this scripture on it. If you see on the, on the back giving boxes, you'll see the same scripture. And it's 2 Corinthians. And I remember it used to cause me a little tension in my heart when I was younger. And I hear somebody come up and share about this passage. It says, each of you should give what you have decided to give in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The part that I always had a hard time is like, I was here, for God loves a cheerful giver. I would always feel like, ah, like... It just never sat well because I always felt like I was a little bit reluctant, felt a little compelled, like I, like I needed to give. But what this passage was saying is that you don't give because of tradition. You don't give because of a veil. You don't give be under a compulsion, but what you decided in your heart. What I know is that if you're a Christ follower in this room, and Ezekiel says, I'm going to give you a new spirit and a new heart. So why? So that you could follow my ways. And as I've grown and as I've matured as a believer, not as a pastor, but as a believer, God has grown me in his ways and his desires, the things that have transformed the way that I think, the things that I care about, to where now I'm able to be a cheerful giver. Because so many times we hear these things, we think about the behavior of God wants me to do X, Y, and Z, not that the heart transformation that he's done in your life. Because God has transformed some things in your life, man, that is only through Him. And maybe that next step is to trust when it comes to finances, because God is all about heart transformation and not behavior modification. So maybe that's your next step is to give. We've got forcible ways to do that. If you want a physical gift or offering, we have a drop box located at each exit and then two in the lobby. You can text Vail to 77977. You can go online at our website at Vail.church or go through our app. All of these ways are simple so we can stay faithful the generosity that God has wired us up to live by. And if you're here today, if you need a prayer, our prayer team is right up front. They'd love to pray for you. If you're going through some stuff, man, join us together in prayer. If you want, if like prayer else in a different format, if you look in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a red card. It has a little spot for prayers. Man, fill that out. Our team would love to pray for you. If you'd like to partake in community, we have elements on both sides of our stages. Um, but we're going to keep this room a little bit uh, on the lower level. So if you want to sit here and just kind of think about today's message, feel free to do that. But for everyone else, uh, man, have a great day. Stay dry out there and don't burn your retinas tomorrow in the eclipse. So see you next week. <laughs>